Hi, I'm Elvin, I'm the CEO of Dr. Wealth, and today with me is Chi King. So he does a lot of uh, video about Alibaba and China stocks at his channel, De Chi King. So today I want to ask him more about China stocks. Okay, and I know that recently he went in uh, all in Alibaba, right? So it is something that's very controversial. Some people think that it's very high risk. Some people think that, you know, yeah, just all in something that is very cheap and obvious and a good value buy with growth prospect at this point in time. And before we go deeper into say Alibaba, let's ask him about the general outlook of China in 2022. We know that in 2021, China suffered like 20 over percent drop while US went up 20 plus percent. So the Delta is 40 percent uh, in terms of performance, right? So how do you see 2022? Will China rebound or will it continue to be a slump in the global markets? Okay, I think, um Thanks for the invite. I'm extremely honored to be on this channel as well. Um, personally, a bit about myself, I do run a YouTube channel. Um, even though um, I do talk a little bit about some China stocks here and there, maybe like Tencent, JD, Alibaba, but I do have a focus in, in Alibaba per se. So I, I believe um, my channel kind of pick up a little bit of speed because um, there are more and more interests surrounding Alibaba as a, as a company. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can see if you go into Google search volume, the, the entire trend <laughs> starts going up and then people are getting more and more interested. So um, just this entire understanding, right? Investing in China particularly, it's a very complex issue. Mm -hmm. I think understanding China itself is, is extremely complicated. Okay. It's a 1.3 billion population. It has thousand years of history. It, it takes a lot of depth and it takes a lot of energy to go and understand. And I'd like to put a disclaimer out there. Um, I don't qualify myself as an Alibaba expert or even a China expert by and large. But um, I probably do have a little bit more reading and understanding mm -hmm. in China because I do place a little bit more focus, especially when my entire portfolio is in, in, yeah. in, in one company like that, right? So just a little bit of sharing, right? Um, we might want to split up the Chinese equities um, in, into two big portions. So as we all know, there's this... Um, a share portion and the mm -hmm. H share portion. Mm -hmm. So I believe most of the viewers out there, especially on the YouTube platform, you guys don't care about the, the A share. You guys don't <laughs> care about what Zhejiang Chemical Group or you guys don't care about Yangtze Power. You guys only care about like all the ADR shares in, in America. So you have your BAT, your Baidu, your Tencent and your Alibaba. You have your Huya, um, you have your Bilibili and all those that are yeah. ADRs listed in America. And in this case, I think um, let's just quantify this discussion um, only to all these American companies. Okay. And maybe just to share a little bit about my understanding of all these companies, right? Even though they are China companies by and large, most of them have USA, US DNA, like part of how the entire structure of, of, of the company that's being run, right? Most of them are, are really just um, very capitalistic in nature. People call Tencent as capital allocators. And in this case, if you were to really look into it, um, the, the outlook surrounding all these different Chinese companies, everybody's extremely anxious. You mm -hmm. can see that it's reflected in the share price. People are selling down, people are exiting, and people say that China is uninvestable. Yeah. But the funny thing is, a lot of all these um, Chinese equities, right, they're listed not day one. It's not, it's not the first year, second year, or third year. They've been listed since the early 2000s. People just suddenly realize that, hey, Chinese is uninvestable. I think there really is this entire manipulation and narrative right now in today's market. I'm not saying that whether is it a value buy, is it a um, um, value trap and people are afraid. I, I believe everybody is, to a certain extent, they, they have they, are, they draw into their own past experiences. Yep. And then they think about, oh, China last time pulled a quick one maybe in the early 2000s, in the early 2010s. Maybe they, they can do it again. And all these worries and fears, right, I would like to say they're all warranted and I can understand where they're coming from. But that said, um, we also have to use a very logical perspective and to think about and really dive deep into the specifics. What exactly is the Chinese government doing? What are they trying to crack down upon? What, what's their mentality? What's their intention? I think this, this is one thing that um, your headline articles, your three minute short read of the article in CNBC, they don't go into the details and explain to you why is the Chinese government um, cracking down on education, for example. Mm -hmm. You have to really go dive deeper and really understand before you make a conclusion and say, that, oh, China is uninvestable. I think that's a very, very, very problematic conclusion that we come towards. So it, it could also be because, you know, the, a lot of media is westernized Correct. and they tend to have a very hostile stance towards what China is doing, right? Correct. They may just take the opportunity and just whack China sure. for it. Sure. Yeah, right. I think it, it's it's a very warranted <laughs> um, um, claim, by the way. And, and I do believe that the media do play a very big role in terms of in the investment world. Mm -hmm. But I think as investors, we all follow our own different philosophies, right? There's a reason why um, there are always famous quotes saying that people buy when others are, uh, people buy when others are fearful yep. and then um, be be fearful when others are greedy. So in this entire case, right, I, I would not 
bold, I would not have a bold speculation, speculation saying that this is a classic example, but it really do feels like, like one when I'm, I'm participating in the markets right now. So, so this, in this entire idea, let's, let's talk about, go back to the question on the Chinese um, equities in this mm-hmm. current outlook in 2022. Um, I, I think for those of us, um, 2022 wasn't really a very good start. I think Nasdaq almost went into the correction territory. I think it was inching to 9 point something percent. And then as, the, as of the recording of this video, it bounded, rebounded back quite a little. So, so in this case, if you were to really look at it, then when you look at Chinese equities, um, especially Alibaba because I've been following quite closely, um, it, it kind of bounced at 110, like two or three times quite, quite significantly. Then in this case, some of, uh, in my own speculation, right, it's really, it became too low and people just cannot ignore. But is it really a good value pay, play or is it whether they can give you a compounded return of kick of 10, 15%? I think we have a lot more to explore there. But that's it. Um, I, I think as of now, um, the Hang Seng Index or, what, or the most of the Chinese companies, they meet a momentarily bottom. But I, I'm not, I, I'm, I wouldn't venture to the guess and say that we have already reached the bottom. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so which means it sounds like you're more positive about 2022 for China than before, I would say. Uh, okay, so so basically for, for myself, right, um, I, I don't really trust in this segregation of what value investing, growth investing. I think um, getting down the fundamentals of investment philosophy is more important. So there are a few rules that, that, that we, we, we mm-hmm. um, follow. And, and personally for me, um, it's just four simples. Um, circle of competence, margin of safety, intellectual integrity and most importantly a lot of a lot of patience okay. I think in this entire idea right of course um, we, we talk about oh um, low P stocks means that you're a value investor um, high dividend yield means you're a dividend investor or high growth prospects um, you're, you're a growth investor I don't really like to qualify and, and really segregate yourself into those small portions because I think in every single school of thought there's, there are things that you can learn and mm. there are things that mm. you, you should employ and most importantly in investing um I don't think there's a very superior investment style. Um, there's only one that's most compatible to you. And in my case, um, within the three, four years of investing, um, I, I get to understand myself a little bit more. And I can tell you, investing is a very expensive game. Like you, you get to, you need to put in real money to understand yourself more. So in this case, it really allows me to understand myself more. And in this case, I distilled that four simple rules. Mm. So in this case, Alibaba really was that, that, that interesting company that the more I understood, the more I, the more I bought into it, the more I tried to understand the entire narrative. Then I got more and more excited. And which is also why you said that, that all in video, right? Yeah. Yeah, I recently just went even more and, and yeah, I, I, I deployed my emergency cash in this case. Okay. But but don't worry, I'm, I still have I, I still have money for my day to day and expenses and stuff. And you're still young. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, correct, and I'm still young. So so why not why not we, we go a little bit deeper, uh, since you talk about that four points, right? How correct. how does Alibaba score in this four aspects? Okay, I think um let, let's remove the last one because um, patience is just um, you sitting on, yeah. sitting on it, not doing anything. So number one, circle of competence, right? Uh, maybe um, people that are as young, I wouldn't say as young as me, but um, I, I would venture that a lot of us are very tech savvy right now, especially people in, Digital their, natives. Thir- yeah, in their 20s and in their 30s, right? Um, you have your apps, your, your Apple, your Google, your Microsoft, and you can see that the FANG stocks, for example, they've done a spectacular job in the mm-hmm. last two years. Yeah. And a lot of people are just buying into S&P 500, buying into holding all these um, big FANG stocks. And they realize that, oh, all these are scalable. All these, all these things have high margins. They're crazy in terms of their investment, their ROIC and whatever measures that you use on them. So, so from, from my own understanding, um, Alibaba also fall into one of those categories because even though a lot of people like to say Amazon is the Amazon of China, I, w- I would highly disagree. Um, JD feels a lot more like Amazon of China. Um, Alibaba is really a, how, how would I put it? It's like a, it's like a, um, um, it's like a descendant of many mixed because they, they not only do they not only do e-commerce and even in their business itself, the model is highly starkly and vastly different from Amazon particularly. So if you were, want me to measure them all right, um, there's a reason why I went all in, right? I, I might I might I, I do understand that um, I might have a very biased view because people you don't all in into a stock that you don't understand and, and how do you have the conviction to sleep at night when the entire market is volatile? And especially when we're in Singapore, 
when the market opens, it's at, it's at our night time and we need to go to sleep. So how do you have that peace of mind to go to sleep? And in this case, through my months and months of research, I really got to understood the company a lot more. And once the value, valuation keeps going down, unless it's some, something fundamental that's destroying the entire company, um, you're just essentially de-risking de yourself because your cost price keeps going down mm. and it, it becomes a more and more attractive valuation. Mm. So, so that's just my general take on, on okay. understanding Alibaba. Okay. And uh, since we talk about regulation, we talk about fundamentals, right? So do you think the Chinese regulations uh, would have hurt Alibaba's fundamental to a certain extent? Okay, I think um, this regulation topic is a very interesting one. Um, we, we can split the regulations into a few parts. Lah. Number one, if, if we, look in, we, we look into regulations specifically, I, I'm not the proudest share, Alibaba shareholder to say that. I, I, I don't know whether you're aware, the er shen yi thing, the two choose one, essentially forcing the hands of the merchant Essentially, there's been, they have been monopolizing the entire market. And the government stepping in and really understanding and, and trying to um, um, solve this entire problem, right? Break it's, the wall, guys. Yeah, it's, it's essentially for the betterment of the people and the consumers. Um, and, and more importantly, for the merchants. Because they, they I, I would venture and I would say that um, people are actually not, 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 not um, hating on the rich people. They're they are just hating on how unfair the competition is. And in this case, Alibaba really did exploit that position. And not only Alibaba, I think even Tencent was part of this entire kerfuffle. But um, Alibaba was the face of the entire China crackdown. So Alibaba got the most beating. And because Jack Ma was the loudest. Uh, While Pony Ma was a little bit more tactful. Um, <laughs> If it, on, on that point, right, just a very quick touch, right? I, I think um, if you were to really look into Alibaba and read, read um, Jack Ma's book, right, um, on the, the, the house that he built, right, um, you actually know Jack Ma isn't really a very smart guy, but he's, he has extremely high EQ. So to, to, to plainly come to the conclusion that, hey, um, he doesn't know what he's doing, he's blaming the government and, and he go out and being very loud, right? I would say that there's more to meet the eye. I don't think that it's just because and uh, the heat of the moment he wishes to score the government. I think there are, that there might be further intentions um, behind why he made that speech, saying that um, they had a pawn shop mentality, saying that the Chinese government is, is, is backward thinking. Um, more importantly, um, there might be something that he wishes to, uh, an agenda that he wishes to drive. But of course, um, you say whether it affects the 2.8 billion fine, uh, I, I would believe that there, there is certain impact. I, I wouldn't say that he went away scot-free. So, so back to the regulation specifically, um, af affecting fundamentals is true, but the problem is um, the fundamentals of Alibaba initially was a little bit unsustainable mm. if, if you were to really look into it and, and be fair to yourself and be fair to the Chinese economy. Um, forcing competition out, um, forcing them to only stay with that one ecosystem and you cannot touch anything else. If you want to do business with me, you can't do business with other people. How is that... Uh, positive business environment for the people. I, 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 don't, I don't get it. So, so in this case, um, if you were to really look into the growth rates and, and if you were to just do a very quick comparison, right? In the e-commerce industry, there are three main players, Alibaba, JD, Pintoto. So um, there has been quite a lot of slowdowns and a lot of problems in China recently, right? I think Evergrande is one, um, the, slowing GDP, um, the slowing GDP is another. Um, all these are real problems, inherent problems that the Chinese government has to fix. Um, if they don't, the US is not going to step in and help them fix all these problems. And more importantly, the more messier it gets, the, the better it is for them. So in, from, from the perspective of the government, I think one, one, one thing that I usually do is whenever I try to do this kind of predictions or projections, right, I try to sit in the shoes of Chairman C. So let's say I'm, I'm governing China today. What am I going to do? I'm dealt with this set of cards. What kind of regulations should I crack down? Should I care about the data? Should I talk, look into the anti-competition behaviours? How, how do I ensure that the economy is going to come out even better from Evergrande, from um, the slowing GDP? So in this case, if you look into the fundamentals, right? Um, just based on off the recent earnings call, um, just based on the top of my head, Alibaba and Pintoto didn't do spectacularly well. In, instead, they actually went, they actually lost, um, they didn't beat um, expectations mm. of Wall Street. JD was the one that punched above its weight and said that, oh, they suddenly grew 20 odd percent, like um, a few percentage points above analyst expectations. So in this case, it's not really Alibaba and Pintoto um, um, fundamentals are essentially changing. I think it's more of JD outperforming while Alibaba and, 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 and Pintoto is reacting to what the market environment is. Mm -hmm. But in this case, um, as long as the walled garden is being removed and Alibaba is not the only one being affected by the regulations, the walled garden of, of Tencent trying to protect JD and Pintoto is also down. So 
in this case, it becomes a more fairer competition. And it really, I do hope that a better competition will essentially break all the management up and try to understand and, and have a much more fairer playing field, while at the same time, all built into their own fundamentals. Try to focus on value creation. What have you have to offer? Why do consumers have to go onto your platform? Mm. What else, um, other than your integration in maybe your logistics arm, your financials and your e-commerce, your cloud computing, your AI and whatever, try to integrate everything and tell people why I'm, I deserve to win. And that, that's really my understanding in the entire e-commerce industry today. And more importantly, you know, the Tencent development. Recently, they sold. And they, they, they gave out JD as a special dividend. They sold C-Limited. A, um, a lot of people like to say that these are forced by the CCP. I would say that um, I, I, I would venture a guess that I don't think CCP high officials told Tencent to do anything about it. I think Tencent was trying to front run the government and trying to understand and try to realign to what they are looking towards and try to understand how the CCP wants to run the country. And in this case, by selling and by throwing JD out, um, by throwing C Limited, a little bit of C Limited out, then some people are even speculating, what oh, if Pintoto is next? So um, this, this is really very interesting times. For those of you who are extremely um, engaged and interested in this space, I think um, it's good to read up a little bit more and to always find out and discover the intention of it. Um, regulations per se, whether is it going to affect the enterprise, whether is it going to destroy the businesses or not, as long as it's unsustainable, it's unethical, and um, it's not going to provide any benefit to the Chinese government, I'm quite sure it's gone in, in a win. But um, if there is still value add and, and there is always a um, value proposition in creating and helping prosper the country and, and the economy by and large, there is always a place to stay. And in fact, I would, I would believe that the Chinese government would want them to continue prospering and to help bring them to greater heights. Mm. So that's my understanding. Okay. So it's almost like, you know, China has taken the opposite direction in managing the country, right? So we talk about, you know, creating a fairer market, uh, bring down the wall gardens. But if you take a look at US, a lot of the antitrust lawsuit just doesn't crack the egg, right? It just yeah. doesn't crack even the wall. <laughs> Don't even talk about bringing it down. And you have Apple who monopolize the app store. You have Android monopolizing the app stores. And, and it seems like just nobody can do anything about it, right? And you know, to, to some investors, they feel that, hey, why not just invest in these US companies? It's a lot easier. Why do we want to take that trouble to invest in China? We still need to second guess what the government is going to do next. Okay, maybe on, on that point, right, um, I, would like to, I, I would like to echo what, what, what you just said, right? To really understand it's two different systems and two different governance you're functioning in. Um, one thing I always warn people, um, the funny thing is I have never go out and tell people, hey, buy Alibaba, guys. Um, it's so cheap. It's a, it's, a, it's a value investment. It's a once in a lifetime. I, I, don't, I don't go out spreading this kind of... I wouldn't, okay, but, but uh, my, my channel is inevitably involved into a cult channel yeah. because people come in to just keep yeah. consuming Alibaba content. But I just like to provide that more logical stance and to tell you and, and really just write down what am I so bullish about and to constantly, I wouldn't say assure, but really to provide just my own perspective yes. that maybe the US media is trying to portray it in a certain way yeah. and I try to uncover what is the real truth. So in this case, um, a different governance system would also mean that when you're doing due diligence, um, there's an extra layer. Rather than saying I go jump into the company and know that, oh, this is the company and, and, and understanding the fundamentals and whatnot. The first layer should always be understanding the government's intention. Mm. And then begs the question, um, why would I spend so much time, so much effort to understand them? Um, I would like to also say that um, even though, um, because they have two different governance system, right? We also have to understand, do, do not be under the illusion that uh, the US government is totally useless. They can't crack down. They can't, they, can't, they can't do anything to a big tech company. I would not even be surprised that once China leads the way into, into how to tackle and how to take, take care of all these big tech companies, um, if there are good pointers, why would, not, why would the US government not learn from them as well? Unless they will believe that a lot of all, all these are, are unfair. But then again, if you look into how the US narrative is being shaped right now, a lot of people are hitting on all the rich people. Oh, capitalism is broken. We need more. We need more. Um, we need, we need to tax the rich. Um, we, need to un we need to make the system a little bit more fairer. And this, is, th this might be momentarily. Um, sooner or later after people forget about it when the economy prosper, maybe everyone will forget and, and move on with life. But I, I just say that, I, I would just like to caution that um, the illusion is there. Um, do not be too confident about, about what you know and, and think that everything you know is, is how things work. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to understanding, oh, a lot of people like to claim that um, the US has a rule of law. So the US um, respect the rules, um, regulators cannot touch them. And, and effectively, if you were to ask um, people maybe in, in, in China or, or people that are observing it, at least I'm a global investor, so I'm observing both, 
both both countries and how they are interacting with the entire regulatory environment. It feels like we are we are rewarding ineffective governance. We are rewarding people that allow people to monopolize and think that oh never mind it, as long as they are they are creating value and, and as long as they it feels like they're creating creating value, but um, we, the actual value creation might be rather debatable. And the entire engagement with the ground today, um, there has been a lot of discussions ongoing as well. So, mm-hmm. so that's just what I would like to um, put across and, and understand mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Okay. So you, you mentioned about patience and um, I, I would like to ask a little bit about that, right? Sure. So it is a very common question that I, I myself always get as well from the other investors. Um, especially when they invest in China, they know that they should have patience, mm-hmm. right? But they always ask, so how long do I need to wait in order to wait out all this regulatory climate, you know, to, to really see a rebound in Tencent, Alibaba, this kind of big tech in China share prices? Do you have any visibility on this? Or, you know, do you think that just, just wait, right? Patience. I think on, on that question specifically, right, um, th- this is not any advice, of course, but really to understand it from your perspective, because every investor, we, we, we are of a different age, different risk profile, we have different dependents, what um, your mortgage, how, how are you living, what kind of lifestyle yeah. you're leading. So um, it's it's also not a good advice to just tell people, oh, um, just buy into the S&P 500 and just wait for 30 years, then you will have your fruits of labor at the end of the day. I think that's a very general advice that will probably not go wrong. But that's it, it might not be suitable for every single investor as well. Who Even has five though, years of horizon. Yeah, it, it might not be suitable and, and people, some people just cannot control themselves. Then what, what are you going to do with that bunch of people that like to trade in and out? Mm. And I don't care about what, um, 30 years you'll promise me a million, two million or five million. I don't care, I just want to play now. So so in this case, we really have to look into the inv- specific investor's temperament as well. So back to the question on when Alibaba is going to rebound. Honestly, I, I don't think anyone knows. In the stock market, nobody, is, that, that's why there's always this saying, right? This long time saying. Don't bother timing the market. Timing the market always beats them. But um, there is this additional additional um, um, factor, exogenous mm. factor here, mm. which is um, Chairman C. So if his mood is good, the China market might rebound tomorrow. He might say that, oh, let's release all regulations. His mood is bad, let's crack down again in 2022. But um, just my own consensus and my own understanding, um, um, just doing a very quick temperature taking. In 2022, China only has one word. Um, I, I, you might want to hear this word um, a lot more frequently in 2022. They focus on this idea of stability. Why stability? Um, economy is slowing down. Evergrande is being a very big pain in the... Yeah. So understanding it from that, that perspective, right? Um, they always like to focus on stability in three aspects, politically, socially, and economically. So in this case, um, whether is there a very huge rebound, I probably won't think so in 2022. But now whether it's Alibaba is trading um, at a dirt cheap valuation, I think a lot of analysts can agree that it's a dirt cheap valuation. You can go into any Wall Street banks, um, all of them will tell you that, oh, the target price is 150, 180, 200. But um, I don't care what the target price is, as long as the narrative is bad, the stock is going to remain remain bad because no big investors, no investors have confidence in that stock. It will it will remain where it is. Um, rather than trying to time when when is it going to rebound, um, for people that are younger, people want to accumulate shares, I think it's it's a good thing. But um, of course, notwithstanding the fact that you have to understand where you're buying into. And one more observation that I had was um, the China regulatory tightening cycle, right? It works in a very interesting wave. So the first cycle that started tightening was actually in 17. Then it started relaxing again. Then in 2020 and 2021, it started tightening again. So if you believe in a cycle of tightening, um, um, then let, let me try to explain very quickly on why is there this intention. Firstly, um, it's like how, I would like to use the three Cs, capitalism with Chinese characteristics. So in China, the capitalism works, the, the capitalism works a little bit differently from the US. The US really just allows um, um, the survival of the fittest. Whichever company managed to monopolize, go ahead. Um, I have no qualms with you trying to take over all the market share as long as you pay off the taxes and, and whatnot. So in China, it's a little bit different is because, um, let, let's first admit it's a humongous country. 1.3 billion. I, I think people can't even comprehend what 1.3 billion people feel like. I think when everybody spit on you, you're dead. Like you, you'll be drowned. If uh, That's the amount of volume that we're talking about. And even in China, the historical context, the splitting of provinces, um, the amount of layering bureaucracies is insane. So um, allowing a straight up capitalism with, um, I don't know, hundreds of states all doing whatever they're doing, um, it inevitably will cause a lot of chaos and havoc. Mm-hmm. So in China's capacity from, from the entire cycle tightening, right, you can really see that um, they will tighten, they'll set the rules and boundaries. Hey, 
um, they, they'll talk to all the provinces and states. Okay, these are the boundaries. Please go ahead and carry on and do your expansion and do your capital allocation. That said, every system, there's this Chinese saying, um, 上有政策,下有对策. Every time there's a system that's created, um, there will always be loopholes that can be exploited. Mm. So that's what they want to do. They will allow you to go, go on free play for three to five years. Um, people ex exploit some of the systems and then they come in and then they try to, try to restrict them again and try to set the boundaries again. Mm. So in this case, you can see it as um, this, this two years, two, two odd years as a session of tightening. So whether um, this tightening will continue, um, whether it will loosen up, whether it will allow for free play again, um, that's up for everyone to decide. But I'd like to believe that, um, I, I wouldn't say that the light in, at the end of the tunnel is near. At one point in time. Yeah, it, at, at one point in time, but um, I would fundamentally believe that it's quite near in, in this entire cycle. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So final question is about um, an advice, right? Since you are very into China, and I believe that there are a lot of audiences who are also into China increasingly, and um, if you have an advice for them, how to approach this China investment, what would it be? Okay, I of course, uh, anything on YouTube is non-financial advice and we are of not course, licensed. Of course, of course. But um, just explaining a little bit about myself, right? Um, I've been buying the dip, of course. I've been, I've been averaging down because I don't bother um, I'm trying to time the bottom and say that um, how, how we are able to catch the bottom and stuff. But I recently had a conversation with my dad. It was quite interesting. He said that um, sometimes you don't have to you don't have to keep averaging down. You might want to wait for the climate to change a little bit, then you start buying. You might not catch at 120 when it starts rebounding back to 180, 200. Um, it might still be a good time because people might still say that it's undervalued. Um, to that, um, I would like to say that if you look at the price pattern, people that buy in at 180 thinking that it's at the, line, at the end of the tunnel uh, might, still, might still go down. So it's a lot of um, investor psychology that's in play here. So that, that, that's why I say, um, um, I'm not a very huge believer of TA, of technical analysis. Um, I'm, I'm a lot more in terms of understanding businesses and, and looking at trends and stuff like that. So in this case, um, for, for investors that are not invested in China, I think um, it's a good time to do your homework. It, it's a great time to do your homework because you have to understand a little bit more into what you're buying. Um, you have to know the regulatory environment and to brush up on your entire historical understanding and um, the characteristics of what they mean by capitalism with Chinese characteristics, what they mean by um, their, so their version of socialism. I think there are a lot of things that you have to, you have to get into the details before you want to start. Um, people use terms very loosely, you know, oh, this is democracy, this is socialism, this is communism. They use words very loosely with all the characteristics all over the place, which um, I personally dislike, but who am I? I'm just a random guy on the internet. But anyway, if we were to look into it, um, those not invested, you might want to you might want to keep some cash at the side because I would believe that the market in 2022 is quite volatile. Um, China, China might not be the only cheap market out there. There mm -hmm. are also there, 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 I would fundamentally believe that there are always opportunities in every single market, in every single sector at any one point in time. Um, it's up to the investor to decide what kind of opportunities he wish to take, what opportunities- Circle of competence. Correct. What opportunities he, he, he would believe that, um, understand him, him understanding it. And, and at the end of the day, um, to add on again the intellectual integrity part don't bluff yourself like don't don't tell yourself that oh um, um, even though if you're wrong I, I also might be open to being wrong about Alibaba it might crash to 80 or even 50 and never rebound back because um, China just banned them into existence mm -hmm. but that's it um, we have to always have a healthy level of skepticism mm -hmm. and in, in this case in this environment today um, because it's going to be a very volatile market, you might want to look into how you're going to um, size your investment appropriately. That's one. Okay, so on the second group of people, right, for people that are, have been invested in China mm. since 2021 and didn't realize their loss, um, they, I would believe that most of them would probably have their bull thesis intact. Mm -hmm. If not, um, they would probably have sold out and think that, oh, it's a trash investment. China cannot, it's, it's uninvestable. And, and from, from that perspective, right, um, I wouldn't say an advice, but really to always go back. Um, to me, right, I, I go back to my DCF and I go, go, back, go through my valuation um, at, at least monthly. So to tell myself that, oh, I need to confirm that. Is anything changing? Um, if I were to go through a very conservative case, is, is anything going to change? And, and am I really bluffing myself? Or, or at, at more importantly, um, is there a better opportunity mm. elsewhere? So um, that's, that's just the understanding on those people that are holding. Um, it's always good to revisit and to understand why you went into it in the first place. So yeah, that's about so it. So basically it's due diligence, right? Whether you are someone who has invested in the Chinese stock market or you're someone who has not even entered the stock market in China but want to, you have to do homework. 
Yes. Yeah, you have to do research. You have to understand the government. You have to understand the climate in China. You have to understand the businesses. That will eventually give you that confidence and the conviction um, to hang on to a good stock and not be affected by the gyration of the share price. Right? Correct. So I, I, I learned a lot from Chi King. Okay? So um, I believe that he will be able to share a lot more information with you in his channel. So remember to check it out. We'll put the link in the uh, description below. So uh, you can just uh, conveniently click on it and you'll go onto his channel. So thank you, Chi King. Yay, thanks, Alvin. All right, so I'll see you the next time. Thank you for watching. Remember to like the channel and subscribe. Okay, okay, okay bye-bye. Bye.